Terry DeFord, Terry and John. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's see, today we have a birthday, Mr. John Thompson.
Um, there's some good information in there. Um, you will also see the September auction item for, uh, for the Rotary District, which they're doing each month as we've communicated. The oral painting is Texas A&M football. It honors the SEC football powerhouse. Meeting will begin on Tuesday, September 1st, last week at 8 a.m. and will close on Wednesday, September 30th at 3 p.m. on the second page. Also, if you click through the connector, you will see, actually, if you haven't seen it before, a picture of our shower trailer sitting right there on page five, I think it is. <laughs> Uh, the Sulphur Club, and in conjunction with the Rotary Club of Adamville, delivered a shower trailer to Sulphur. Uh, we did that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Jake Cavanaugh actually came and picked it up. Uh, this trailer will allow the first responders helping Hurricane Laura <coughs> efforts to have a hot shower during this time of great need. Um, and it is the it can keep up. Can keep up. Uh, so they actually were looking for more. And uh, certainly uh, very interested, the district is, in, in having an additional. Uh, and you can continue and see different people, different people of action, Rotary Clubs helping with supplies and preparations for the hurricane victims. <coughs> I'm going to pass this sheet around again. Um, if you can get this. The first one is for hurricane relief funding. So different ways that we can as Rotarians help. There is four, five, four different ways here. One, the first one is supply donation. Again, we will continue getting supplies from the community, which will be dropped off in the six different locations across the parish and in, in Abbeville. Uh, and we will, we will bring those supplies wherever they need. We understand that there are great needs here in our very own parish with many families. We're get, I'm getting a lot of communications and help. Um, I've been working with the Harvest uh, Group, Christian Service Center. Actually, the day before, no, no, that was the day of the wedding. No, the day after the wedding. Saturday, we went and delivered a huge supply of food to a family in great need south of Iraq in Delta. Living in a camper that flooded and is almost practically inhabitable. Uh, living out of the ice chest, uh, but we bought them food and items necessary to keep them going for a while. Um, they have other families of, of great need in our parish, also as you go south um, toward the Conalan area. There are also people of great need that are in our hotels. Um, so I actually have a truckload of clothes, full truckload, which we got from Lake Charles to give back to people in Remain Parish. So I will be dropping that off at the hotels or working with Glenn or getting into the ark or wherever it needs to go this afternoon. Um, so we're, we're helping as many people across the parish. Uh, but let me tell you, for those of you who were there this weekend, please stand. Please stand. Tell you the story without getting emotional. So I, I may just allow you to see it for your first hand. But let me tell you, the need is real. It is very, very real. You don't see it on the news. There are no shelters for these people to go to because it wasn't open because of COVID. Um, there, are way to, there are ways to follow those guidelines and still manage appropriately. But it was not done. And it's still needed. Um, people living in cars. People living in tents on the beach of Lake Charles. People living in tents on Rutherford Beach. People living, sleeping in the parking lots. And this is real. Uh, so we need to continue to assist uh, all those in need, of course, and we will, we will do so. We're obligated to do so. So I'm going I'm to pass this around. Again, supply donation, pick just one. That's all we ask is that every Rotary help with at least just one thing. And I know some of you weren't here last week. Um, and that's all okay. I will reach out. Supply donation, either a dollar amount or bring some supplies to one of our six drop sites. Check that out, okay? Meal prep, we will continue to do that. We want to prep for here. We want to prep for 
other areas. So we went to Lake, Greater Lake Charles, but there's the Ritter, there's the Quincy, there's Welsh, there's Sulphur. There's many areas that are still in great need. Um, and crew cleanup crew now, if someone wants to do that and offer that service, or raffle tickets. Um, I'll let Rob talk about that in a, little, in a second if you want to. Uh, we're working directly with Brian Campbell to offer a raffle uh, in which it's a Disney trip for a week in the Christmas season of 2021, Thanksgiving and Christmas season, that you can purchase a chance for $25. One chance for $25 or five chances for 100. You can choose that. Your money will be directed to Rotary 6200 District Foundation. We're working with, with Yvonne and Frank to make sure that happens. And the funds for that will be distributed and utilized in the Rotary Clubs of the area affected by Laura King Laura. 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 So um, that way we know that those monetary funds will be used appropriately at the appropriate time. So we're passing that around. With that being said, I haven't even talked to Rob and, and, and the rest of the group yet, but Lisa said we're going back Saturday, somewhere. I said, okay, we're going. So she wants to cook a spaghetti, a large spaghetti and a crawfish pot, large noodles, and get some, get some plate lunches and just go somewhere and serve as many as we possibly can. So if anybody is interested in wanting to come Saturday, uh, on the sign up sheet, just write check, a check mark for Saturday and I'll contact you. We're gonna look for donations. Um, we're gonna just do ground meat, spaghetti sauce, noodles, and bread. Uh, I would really like the garlic bread from Rabi. That you guys make it cut up. But um, we are going to do that Saturday. Uh, so if anybody wants to participate, just let me know. Chris. Chris. Yes. You know, I've, I've traveled north of Lake Charles, South, and so forth over the last week. And you know, Lake Charles is getting a lot of help. But I'm going to tell you the outline here. Out. What you mentioned to Quincy. The Quincy's like, they are wiped out. Yes, sir. Uh, so it may be something that we could get some supplies in the outer areas. Yes, sir. I, I, we've got some supplies yeah. for in Rob's warehouse and in the trailer. I'm going to bring it with me this Saturday. So whatever we have, we're going to, we're going to bring it. Whatever we, we, we're actually for an assessment needs at the hotels for the refugees that are here. And if there's specific items that they need and we have, we're going to bring to them first as well, too. Um, so you're, you're correct. Um, it's the outer areas that really need help. So another way for um, donation of time, there is a company called BRQ. They have, I don't, I don't, don't ask me that, what the acronym means, barbecue something. <laughs> I think it's a restaurant out of Baton Rouge. It's out of Baton Rouge. It's, uh, they distribute 25 to 30,000 meals a day. So they're asking for volunteers, people to drive and deliver. Um, we actually saw them across the street from where we were preparing our food. They bring hundreds and hundreds of prepackaged plate lunches. I don't think it's hot food, or because, you know, but it's food and it's something for them. So that's another way for us to give back. I can tell you that we're very appreciative of the hot food. Rob, you slaved over that pit. You and Gary Thibodeau not here. And to cook leg quarters, Jim, it was good, but it takes a long time to cook. <laughs> no, um, but anyway, it was, uh, it was great. Um, so let, I'm going to also, also passing this around, get that started again. We talked about that last week. This is for the cattle festival fundraiser that they were having here at the Red Barn on September 23rd. We need volunteers to help them. They have a team and a group that's going to cook a jambalaya. We need volunteers to help plate and serve as people drive to pick up. It will be September 23rd, so that's a Wednesday. We will have our new meeting at 11, from 11 to 12 there at the Red Barn. That will be your meal for that particular day. So we're passing the sheet around. On the sheet, the first column 
is if you would like to purchase any extra meals besides your own for your workers or whichever, write a number down there and we will bill you on your quarterly invoice for those meals. The second column is to volunteer. Any of us who want to come early to help do some prep, make the meals, and then even work and deliver. They're going to be delivering from 11 to 1 uh, as the people come and pick up. I do have some tickets. Rob has tickets at his shop, and they're also selling tickets every day at the Redborn from 8 to 12 in the office. If anybody is interested in purchasing. Okay? Chris. And, yep. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little confused about the, the number of extra tickets. So are we getting to, are, is it Rotary going to get tickets? And these are, we have to purchase extra ones? If you want to purchase some for your business, in other words, your meals is like you'd be coming here. Okay. We'll be for you, there for you at the right point, but let's see if you want to buy like for extra meals for all your employees, yes. that's what you want to do. And then and they will and we'll deliver it to the okay. to your place. <laughs> Any questions on the past and on the sign up sheets or the raffle? It raffle you want to explain anything more on the raffle? That's we're going to have some more information on it probably uh, about Monday. Me and Don have been working on the tickets, and I actually have a Zoom meeting with all the uh, club Thursday. residents in the district tomorrow night at 6. So once everything's finalized, we'll, we'll get back uh, to you all with some more information. Our after hours meeting is to this evening. Uh, instead of at Rockstars of Hardware in Maurice, it's going to be at Avenue Electric Conference Room across the street at the Old Lumber Yard at 6.30 anyone who is willing and wanting to attend. Okay? Any questions? I'll be glad to talk to you after the meeting if you want to hear any stories uh, or, or what's going on or give me any suggestions or any feedback uh, of what you're hearing in the community or what is needed. Um, we want to impact and, and give back and assist as many as right. appropriate. Yes? Great. I'll use the analogy that to go fishing, it's not how far you have to go. And sometimes you pass up the fish before you get 200 miles offshore. We have a crisis in our town and all the towns around us with the motels filled with people who want everything their own. Yes. So anything we can do for our local problem I think it's good for a local rotary club. These people are also the forgotten people living in tents on the beach. So I shared your phone number for people that have contacted me. What can we do to help the people in our hotel? Yep. So absolutely, absolutely. There is a plan to go cook. Yes. Um, we actually going to take the cook trail and set up at the hotel and cook and, right. and give meals. We just haven't set a date with Lynn yet right. because they have several people that have volunteered to do so and we don't want to cross over that. So that is coming. Very, very good it point. Right. Exactly where I'm going. Great. 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 Absolutely. Very, very good point and exactly what I'm mentioning that we need to take all into consideration of our people here and all of those in need. So appreciate that. Glenn? I don't know if you need to go there. I understand they're, they're housing a lot of people in New Orleans and Baton Rouge Hotel. And I'm assuming they're getting reimbursed for that. What about the people here in the hotel? Are they getting financial help? I don't know that question, the answer to that question. That's a good question, though. And um, I know the state's proposing a contract with the hotel in New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And what do they do here? I don't think so. I don't know if there would be. We can definitely find that out. Okay. All right. Paul, we'll present, and then after the meeting, I mean, we can sit and uh, and chat. Paul, oh, I like your shirt, man. But <laughs> 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 sure. Well, again, it's always a pleasure to stand up here. Let's make sure I get through it the whole time today. Okay. <laughs> Today, it's very, very good pleasure to be able to introduce to y'all Zach Dubois. This young gentleman has, he's my idol already, okay, because I grew up fishing from the time I could walk 
till now, and I'm still fishing. But I never learned how to make any money doing it. So this guy has, all right? Zach has been a lifelong citizen of Kaplan, graduated Kaplan High. His, his parents are Darren and Eve Dubois. And they're also a lifelong citizens of Kaplan and the Jamaican Parish. He met his wife, Paula, while attending UL Lafayette, and they have been married for three years. Now, we won't hold that against you, but you need to go to have a shoot. That's okay. All right. yeah, he has a bachelor's degree in industrial design from UL Lafayette. While right there, he was a member of the Raven Cajun Bass Fishing Team. Now, why didn't they have a soccer team or something like that when I was in school? So, you know, I kept going from school to school because they would all ask me to leave. So anyway, we got into the hard hat team. Yeah. <laughs>
which is different from industrial technology. I was actually in the School of Arts. So what it really is is kind of, I call it like glorified inventing in a way because if we would design concepts and solve problems of, of you know, handmade products or any kind of products, it could be cars, uh, handheld objects, phones, just anything, even software, how to lay out and design of software. And so we learned all of that, basically how to come up with a concept of a product and then follow it through so you get your final product and then after that, how you manufacture it, how you get on the real world market, how do you make it, how do you market it to sell it. So, and we learned all the skills in between all of that. And so joining the Bass team and kind of diving in head first with going fish tournaments and realizing that it's not just about going to sit in the boat and drink a few beers and try to catch some fish. This was a little more efficient tournament, so it's a competition. You have eight hours in the day, you gotta go run to your best spot, you gotta go practice, you gotta figure out what color, what bait, what technique the fish wanna bite and get your biggest spot fish, bass fish that you can catch in a tournament to win the tournament. And it was a pretty big eye opener for me because I went first one thinking, oh, it's gonna be fun, you know, get to go fish and compete and, and represent the school. And uh, then I go and there's all these other boys, and at the time, this was in the, the college circuit, really kind of just getting started. But there's all these other schools, and their schools paid for their boats and trucks and rafts and all of my goodness. And we showed up in a little 18-foot bass tractor, you know, limping our way all the way up to Arkansas. And uh, we get there and we fish, and it was fun. I still had a blast doing it, but I was like, yeah, we definitely need to uh, step our game up a little bit. But I realized I needed to step my game up fishing-wise. So kind of joined a team and doing more terms of fishing. And, and also, as I progressed into the design school, I uh, kind of learned how to do more manufacturing techniques and all that. And, and so during that, it was always a mix of I learned how to bass fish with a certain lure or a technique and reading bassmaster.com and then I would go look up lures and then I would also learn and I you know I'd see how they were made or I'd, I'd kind of de re engineer them and think about how they could be manufactured and or how to improve them or add this, add that. So I'd always tinker with baits and stuff too. And um, I think it was in my third year when I learned how to first 3D model, and then we also had access to 3D printers. And so I just did this little generic crawfish design on my computer, which that alone, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I actually made a 3D model of fish board. And then I had my professor 3D print it for me so I could print it and hold it in my hand. And, you know, at least it wasn't the actual movable pulp plastic that I used, but it was the 3D bait. And I was like, oh, this is cool. <clears throat> well, I wanted to actually be able to use it like you would a soft plastic bait, so then I research how to make a mold and cast it and stuff. And that's where I learned how to, the first beginnings of uh, how to do soft plastic molds. And so I did, I made, I cast me a little silicone mold. And then <coughs> one weekend we went to our camp and I learned how to melt down old plastic. And we had, my dad's got hundreds and hundreds of pounds of soft plastic bait off. I melted some well, the first go around, I melted them in my mom's microwave. And that didn't go so well. <laughs> and so I had to find another way. And uh, so I got it and I shot the little mold. And then ultimately we kept it out on the water. I remember being on the on our dock and I fished with it. And I, I caught a bass. It wasn't a big bass. It was you know, very small. But I was like, whoa, this actually worked. I created a product from concept to scratch that I wanted to stop. Concept to catch a fish on it, and it worked. So I was super pumped, and um, so I kind of dabbled all with that in that process. Well, uh, fast forward to my senior year. Look, well, so what I would do is kind of design my own little baits, and I would think I had this competitive edge when I go to the UL tournaments and stuff because I was like, oh, these guys don't have what I have, you know. But uh, it didn't really help that much. It made me feel better. So, fast forward to my senior year, I ended up actually qualifying to be in. And so I entered the competition, uh, got second place and all that, so I qualified to be in this class. But what this class was, it uh, taught you 
I guess, the bootstrap and the beginning to the basic start of the business and the launch and everything. And so going through that class, because even before I started you, I wanted to kind of go into business because I thought business was interesting, but I just ended up finding this instead. So I always still had that business interest in the back of my mind. So this class was like my first, my way of learning business. So it was fun to me. And um, so at the end of it, my little ice chest idea, everybody thought it was pretty good. They wanted me to pursue that. But when I realized I needed $250,000 and I was a broke college kid, it probably wasn't going to happen. And uh, so anyway, I graduate and uh, I get a job working in Lafayette. And I was actually, I actually got a job in Lafayette working as a marine designer. And we actually designed big aluminum crew boats that I built like in uh, Franklin and Jeanette and all that. And salt crap and metal shark and all that. And I got that <coughs> job because my senior project was actually, I designed my own bass boat because I enjoyed bass fishing. So that was my whole project. I got to work with your boats that. And so that kind of actually led me to my first job. So I get a job and and so, you know, I go to work every day. I got, so I graduated, got my job not long after. So I'm like, oh, you know, I can start my, start my life with my career. You know? So I, I go to work and I get home every day and then I just, that's just how I was living with my parents and stuff. And uh, I just go home and play PlayStation and do boring stuff. You know, I was like, I, I kind of I wanted to do something else. And then I'd always make little baits, but I would just make them here and there. You know, I wasn't getting too crazy with it. But uh, so finally one day I just had the idea. I was like, well, you know, I learned how to do a business. Like, I want to start a little business. You don't have to be nothing crazy. Just do something. So I decided to do fishing lures because I thought, well, I can make, I can make some cool baits, you know. People, people might use them. And uh, so I started doing that. Got my LLC and everything. Pretty much started from there. I, I, I brought a few with me. And I started uh, started pretty small with some little aluminum molds like this, and then I actually had like Presto pots that I would heat up the plastic in, and I would suck them up with these big manufactured syringes, and then inject them into the molds like this. And I do it basically by hand, and so. When I started, I would do that for a long time, and then I'd uh, go to work, and I'd come back, and I'd work from 5 o'clock, and then kind of finish at 12 o'clock at night and in my dad's shed, which he didn't have any air conditioner or any ventilation. So uh, it was kind of a good thing OSHA never came. <laughs> but, uh, so it kind of grew a little bit, and I was always busy, but uh, you know, I do it, I always say, oh, it'd be cool one day, I could do this all day, you know, eight hours in a day, I get so many baits done, you know, and I can sell them and sell more, you know, that was always the, the big dream. So anyway, I get mar we get married, and uh, married Kayla, and then we got a little house, and then uh, where our house was, I had like this small 12 by 16 little closet, I call it, and uh, me and my dad fixed it out with ventilation and AC, so I could kind of work comfortably when I needed. And I was fine at first, and uh, the business kind of kept growing and growing, and it really grew through a lot of social media. Uh, to me, this, when I first started, I thought the best thing would be for me to maybe just start a website, and I could start selling directly there, and help get the name out, and that helped through the social media, Instagram, and stuff. See, and it was, for me, I felt like I was on top of that uh, at, at my age at that time. And then now, with all the social media platforms nowadays, like you, my younger sister's 10 years younger than me, and now all the stuff going on with social media, I feel like I'm out of touch. So, anyway, so I kind of really harnessed all of that, and that's what helped grow the business over time. So, fixed up my new little shop, and I was doing that, and like I said, I always thought I could, uh, you know, if I had a full time, if I do it full time, I could get more done, that was kind of the goal. But, uh, so anyway, I always say, well, I'll just wait till I can make plenty of money as I was making that work and then I'll do it and all that. Uh, that's just the big dream. So anyway, get married, work for about two weeks. Well, the next the Monday I go into work, the boss says, well, i got to let you go. I'm like, okay. And it's kind of at the time, at the time when the oil field was kind of on that bottom end and then it kind of finally trickled down to the whole boats and nobody's buying vessels no more and all that, so uh, like, well, I guess it is what it is. And at first I was upset, you know, I was like, well, I don't have a job. But the second back of my mind, I was like, well, I guess I could make baits, you know. 
really all I had left to do to try to make any kind of income. So I went, basically the next morning I woke up, I went to my shop, and it was a weird feeling because I always thought, you know, I was used to getting home after work after five and start. And I was like, all right, I can start now in the morning at eight o'clock. It's weird. So I just went in and made a few baits, but I didn't have like any crazy orders, so I was like, what do I do? So I just started calling back to stores and that I knew that morning, and yeah, it was, you know, some of them were like, no, we don't know, want one, some of them were like, yeah, we'd love to have them, and it just kind of, I just basically just started hustling from there, trying to figure out how I can sling fishing lures all over the place, and uh, so that kind of grew and grew, and uh, so now I started doing it full time, and uh, it, I used to think, well, man, I wish I had a full day to do base, but now I have a full day, a full day to do base, and still not enough time to get everything done. So, uh, and kind of doing it full time is really where the, the business, the true, true, I'd say, business side too really teach you guys learn. You guys learn about it. sales taxes. Uh, I have it. I have to pay an excise tax, it's called. Um, and just all kinds of different, you know, business concepts of how to run it and how to manage it. And uh, that's ultimately, sometimes it's a headache, but Anything. They buy them from me and they use them and they like 
could have stained material and then made it t-shirt. They print the t-shirts. So the same same exact material, uh, except I had glitter, glitter and pearl powders and the different materials to make them look certain ways. But I, it actually the plastic will sort out holes like it looks like milk. If I was to take that plastic and heat it up by itself, it would come out crystal clear. So I had I have recipes basically for every single color that I make to give this one, you know, a purple color or a green or a red and all have flavors. Because there's a lot of science in like this might actually look purple to you on the outside. But when you put it in water and sunlight hits it and reflects it. It actually looks a different way. So that's, you know, and that's just, that comes from the natural, the natural tissue experience that I have. What do you think is more important, the actual design of the lure or the, or the color of the lure? Because I've, I've been fishing with different right. people. They'll take the same lure and they got 15 different colors of the same damn lure. And then I got some guys I've gone fishing with, they got one lure, but they got a hundred of the same color. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that's the that's the million dollar question really, but I always try to pretty much break it down. Uh, to me, in my personal opinion, the action it's there. It's a close first and second. Ultimately, the action will always get a fish to react to it and want to buy it, whether it's hungry or it's not. But a color acts as like the profile shade to it, or it will look it can look natural to where I want to get them. To but to me, if you have, you could put something that's just solid white, like for redfish in the marsh, they use solid white uh, bait. I mean, what in nature looks solid white, nothing, but the action is what gets the redfish to look and they go after it and they just eat it because that's how they react to it. So all around, I think the action first is what plays into it to make a good bait. But then the color choice is, is a close second and the third is scent. Um, those that's the top that's my tier breakdown what I think makes a good thing right. All right. Oh. 